Welcome everybody to our next panel. Is cannabis coverage fair or biased? And I wanna welcome Jeremy, Natalie, and Javier for our audiences joining us around the world. Can you guys please go around and introduce yourselves and share how you got started on the cannabis beat? And I'll start with Natalie, ladies first. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Natalie Fertig and I'm the federal cannabis policy reporter at Politico. Um, I got started on the cannabis beat completely by accident. I actually um, went with a colleague who interviewed Rick Steves about cannabis in Europe. And um, I, you know, we worked with Normal on that story. And then after that, Normal kept pitching me other stories and I kept doing more stories and uh, kind of just fell into it and then got hired to do it at Politico. And it's been a wild ride. Um, I definitely did not expect the grand scheme of what cannabis policy reporting would be. And it's been really exciting. Especially coming off of, you know, last year's election and you guys have been really knee deep in, in so much going on. It's been fun to, you know, see your, your coverage unfold. Jeremy, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jeremy Burke. I'm Business Insider's uh, senior cannabis industry reporter. Um, and like Natalie, you know, I didn't design to have my career be centered on the cannabis beat. Um, I started on uh, Business Insider's news team and, and kind of wrote about cannabis stories since I was interested in it, you know, just selfishly, I, I, I liked it in college. And so I was interested in the policy and, and, the, and the industry, you know, being built around it. Um, and so what started as kind of one-off stories ended up becoming 50% of my time. And then a couple of years ago, 100% of my time, um, we just figured that there's a big opportunity for, you know, mainstream publications like Business Insider, um, I, I should say now Insider, we did the name change, um, mainstream publications like Insider to kind of cover the industry in a fundamental way and not do kind of one-off things like product reviews or, you know, 10 best strains, but really look at the company like the, or the industry like the multi-billion dollar uh, industry it, it is. Yeah, that's great. And Javier, you know, you're writing for, for a couple publications. Talk to us about your journey into the space. I mean, same as Natalie and Jeremy, kind of fell into it. Also loved it in college, you know, for different reasons. Um, and I was, you know, this random guy from Argentina writing about hedge funds, insider trading, biotech, small cap, you know, stocks, and, you know, being published in major publications like Market Watch. So I was happy with that. And one day our editor asked me if I was willing you know, to put my name on an article on cannabis stocks. I think this, it was like 2014. Um, and I did. And again, same thing. People just started pitching me and sharing information. And that, you know, became a, a career. Uh, 2014, I also got a job at Benzinga. It's a financial media and technology company out of Detroit. Uh, we started covering cannabis uh, very frequently. Discovered it was a really good business. There was a lot of interest. Uh, nowadays, I'm the managing director for Benzinga Cannabis. We have about 60 people working on cannabis related initiatives, put out about 400 articles a month, uh, and recently co founded El Planteo. Uh, it's a Spanish news website uh, focused on cannabis, psychedelics, and other things, you know, green, if you will, uh, or progressive. And again, it's been going great. Uh, funded by my bosses at Benzinga under the condition that I did not leave Benzinga. They funded my project, which is awesome. And I really thank them. And it's been a wild ride. So that's like the Cliff Notes version of it. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of 2014, Javier, um, so I'll start off this next question with you. You know, some of you guys have been covering the cannabis space since the beginning of, I would call like modern, the, the modern legalization movement. So how would you compare the coverage in mainstream media today compared to when the legalization movement just started around a decade ago? How has it changed? I mean, in so many ways. Um, so I, I'll throw out a couple of shout outs. Um, when I started writing about cannabis talks, uh, there was, from what I knew, Deborah Borchard and Alan Brockstein doing different things. But that was pretty much about it, right, in, in terms of stock coverage. Um, they were always very serious. Uh, and I don't think their style has changed particularly now, I think. Much of, of what they've and we've done has trickled down to mainstream media and, and how it has been approached. Uh, publications like Politico or Insider have approached it the, you know, in the right way from the beginning, but most others haven't. And you know, this is something we've discussed um, many other times in the past, us four. Uh, anything related, you know, anything ranging from, from the excessive use of punning to, to simply not understanding what cannabis was, right? how it was different from marijuana, right? Why was it not this devil's lettuce it was made to be, right? Why it had economic potential? 
and and all these things are now starting to really show up in mainstream media and and reporters across the board seem to be understanding it and kind of abandoning the the giggle factor that used to dominate until at least last year right i think the the last year between you know the essential designation big advancements all over the world big advancements in the us have really changed those perceptions um but i don't know if, if, if my co-panelists would agree. Yeah, and even, uh, you know, as somebody who's pitching the media all the time, when we started pitching it in 2014, to that point, there were very few people covering it, but also on the mainstream side, when we would go to like the lifestyle publications, because these, you know, brands were starting to look mm. like anything you would see in a Sephora or a Whole Foods, when we first yeah. started pitching, you know, Vogue or Oprah or Elle, they wouldn't touch it. They thought their readers, you know, would shun it. And now they're covering it more regularly. So and even from yeah. our perspective, we have way more people that we can be pitching now and different angles that we can going that we can be going in with where it was just like the business angle um you know early on so that's yeah. pretty gratifying to see um you know jeremy what about you how how's it changed for you you've been doing this for a really long time also yeah yeah i think uh you know javier hit the nail on the head i think it you know it went from kind of the the stocks get lifted <laughs> type post with a with a picture of a guy like smoking a, a gross looking doobie to actually <laughs> you know uh, uh you know like nuts and boys boilerplate commodity coverage like cannabis is a commodity it, the price goes up the price goes down so we cover that um it's an industry with companies like i mentioned before with multi-billion dollar market caps that deserve to be taken seriously you know they lobby the federal government they lobby the state government they have um you know fortune 500 corporations own significant chunks of of equity in the companies and so you know we thought that 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 really needed serious coverage aside from the punniness or the you know stocks get lifted uh that i mentioned in headlines there um and I think, I mean, I think our coverage is better for it, right? I think the industry deserves to be taken seriously. Um, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's an emerging sector and it's kind of a journalist's dream to be covering it. There's a lot of great companies and there's a lot of not so great companies and there's a lot of people doing the right thing and a lot of people doing the wrong thing. And it's really demands, uh, I think, strong coverage and uh, not necessarily adversarial, but coverage that uh, brings some rigor into the industry, I think. I totally agree. And Natalie, what, what about you from your perspective? Because you're covering it from yeah. different lens also. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that political publications have been a little slower to pick up on cannabis coverage than business publications. So I definitely am the newest person to this table of the three of us reporters here, um, especially national um, organizations. Obviously, you know, the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, Seattle Times, Denver Post, uh, you know, they've all been covering their state's politics surrounding cannabis for a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, just anecdotally at Politico, I mean, I work with a lot of different beats. And I think when Politico was like, hey, we have a, we're going to have a cannabis team. It was sort of seen with that, really? Huh, okay, funny, interesting. But then as, and I actually put a note on my desk when I first started that said, come talk to me. I bet I can find a cannabis angle to your beat. And journalists can never turn down a challenge. And so they'd come up and they'd be like, what do you think you can do with tech security? And I was like, <laughs> dispensaries have a lot of information and they were like whoa we should do a story on that so it was like everyone kind of as I think just the presence of someone covering it from a serious politics policy point of view made everyone realize oh this is a healthcare story this is a criminal justice reform story this is a you know drug scheduling story this is agriculture you know this is a lot of different things I mean it's at, we've been here at Politico now for like a, a year and a half. And I think it's, they're just so used to us now. Like we're sometimes I'm like, Hey, you can't cover that. That's my beat. <laughs> Cause some <laughs> other team starts to do cannabis stuff, but it's right. just good to have it all. So to that point, so, you know, Politico has built out this cannabis beat coverage that you're covering, right? Uh, Javier, that's been your main mandate and Jeremy yours too. So do you mm -hmm. think it's, it hurts or is helpful or like does it pigeonhole cannabis that have to be its own beat versus having like a healthcare, you know, reporter pick up a cannabis story because there's, you know, the, let's say the GW acquisition, you know, a, a few weeks ago. So what do you think it means to have like a cannabis beat reporter or is that given more like relevance because yeah. it needs its own beat? I, I think, you know, two, two things. And I, I totally agree with Natalie's point that, uh, you know, reporting on the industry and, and cannabis policy has been gotten a little bit more diffuse around our newsroom as more people kind of want a slice of the pie. I think uh, journalists do have egos and I'm not taking myself out of that equation. You know, I, I want to be known as the expert and I, I'm the person that covers this and I write these stories. 
That being said, as Natalie mentioned, there's a lot of room on the beat. The story touches everything from criminal justice to tech, startup financing, uh, public equities, like it touches really everything and a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of room to cover it. Um, in terms of it being a definitive beat in of itself, right? I mean, I develop sources in the companies themselves that, that sell or cultivate cannabis, whether it's a startup or, or a public company. You know, I'm the one paying attention to earnings. I'm the one sort of talking to executives and, and investors in those companies every single day. So I do think these companies are large enough and important enough that it does demand a sort of full-time 100% focus. That being said, you know, um, credit to Insider. I mean, it's a very collaborative newsroom. I'm totally happy to work with a lot of other reporters on stories as it touches their beats. Uh, you know, whether that's our politics reporters in D.C., um, you know, it's obviously, as uh, you all know, it's becoming a very big story um, on the federal front. Um, you know, whether that's our real estate reporters, uh, there's a lot of REITs, um, real estate investment trusts and cannabis that, that we're looking at, uh, whether it's tech reporters. I mean, there's a ton of VC money going to cannabis startups. There's a lot of room for it, but I do think that the uh, intricacies of the industry do demand a full-time focus with the, uh, you know, the difficulties of operating as a business in, in that environment. Yeah, I have to agree. And I have this conversation a lot as we're talking, you know, to new business, you know, they say, why should we go with like a cannabis PR firm versus like a mainstream PR firm? Because sure. there are nuances, right? There are nuances that you guys will only know because you're covering all these companies so regularly, you're talking to them all the time. But I have to imagine that having that specific beat, you're not going to know that if you're generally covering, you know, Johnson and Johnson to do a healthcare story, there's so much background information, you're going to have to, to know to actually do like a, a really robust story. So I have to imagine that's part of it as well. And yeah, Javier, no, I would do. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please. No, go ahead. I was passing it well, over. You guys jumped. In. I was. I was just going to say. You know, from a politics perspective, I can see business covering cannabis for forever, right? As a specific beat. I do think that for politics and for Politico, a lot of the fact that we have three people dedicated to this specifically, rather than spreading it out between agriculture and healthcare, which it was, by the way, we had an mm -hmm. agriculture reporter covering hemp. We had someone who covers drugs more generally on the healthcare beat covering cannabis and, you know, GW pharmaceuticals and things like that. And they do still often pitch in when we have those stories, but because of the very specific place that cannabis is politically right now, it made a lot of sense to have someone who could combine all of those very disparate things. And I don't know if that will be long-term. I don't know if there will be a Politico cannabis team in 20 years. Um, you know, it might, if it, you know, it, things, everyone I talk to says this is moving toward legalization, legalization happens and those things might disperse back into mm -hmm. agriculture and healthcare and those things. But like for this mm -hmm. period of time, there needs to be someone specifically looking at this and going, what's happening and how do we pull all of these different threads together? That makes a lot of sense. And Javier, you got 60 people covering cannabis. So you definitely have a perspective Not here. Not here. It's more of a general thing, right? We have like programmers and people working on events and people working on sales and partnerships, right? We have probably six dedicated writers, right? And uh, and then other people who, again, pitch in. And I, I mean, what I was thinking while, while you were talking is, you know, Rosie, you mentioned at first pitching cannabis as a lifestyle story or as a kind of novelty. And, and then, you know, as, as, as Natalie mentioned, business kind of kicked in and finance and then policy. And now it's kind of a more of a, mainstream culture kind of issue as well right and and part of that evolution was you know special like people getting specialized but at the same time a lot more people being able able to cover it right so i see a little bit of both right you do need specialized reporters looking into things like following earnings for companies and understanding the multiples right or or understanding who uh, are the main players in policy, right? And and why Mitch McConnell can be good or bad, right? Or whomever, like Chuck Schumer, I don't know, like, and 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 all these discussions are super nuanced, and and the the audience for those specific and specialized discussions is one, and there's a different audience. And what I noticed, for instance, at Benzinga, is suddenly we have um, a, a senior. Uh, analyst called Wayne, and when suddenly he he talks about analyst reports, and they drive a lot of attention because he tackles cannabis, a very specific topic from a very mainstream angle. Or Sinzio in London, suddenly you know uh, looks at, at at stock moves or 
or, or you know, things like that. And again, they drive a lot of attention. And, and then the, the specialized team writes for a different audience that many times overlaps with the mainstream audience, but not necessarily, right? So I see a little bit of both uh, in, in this evolution. I don't see uh, the, the fact that we have specialized reporters inherently hurting or benefiting the cause, the industry, the movement, you know, uh, it, it, it really comes down to finding the right balance, right? So when, when you're talking to a specialized audience, maybe you want a specialized reporter. And when you're talking to a non-specialized audience, you want more of a general reporter who does understand the beat, right? You know, writing one-off okay. stories is never ideal, right? A lot of reporters have to do it. But it's not ideal if you're writing about biotech one day, airlines the other day, you know, uh, finance the third day. And that, that, that was what I did when I started writing about finance when I was 22. One day I was writing about American Air, Airlines and the, the other day I was writing about whatever, you know, like just a dollar general with the same level of authority, right. you know, and clearly I didn't know as much about every one of these industries, right? Yeah, that's definitely a reason, you know, you know, for being, uh, you know, having specificity, you know, or subject matter expertise in something. But also, I would love to, you know, you know, flip the question. What are some of the challenges in covering cannabis or being a cannabis beat reporter? Like, what do you guys, how is it different? Um, I'm making this. Uh, Natalie, go for it. Oh, sorry. I'm making this face when Javier was talking about jumping beats because I feel like in policy, I'm always jumping beats. Like I am a healthcare reporter. And then I'm, I'm, I, I ask Jeremy tons of questions on Twitter. I'm just like, what is this <laughs> business term that I have no clue what it is? And it's just, I'm, I cover cannabis, but at Politico, we had 16 verticals like healthcare and agriculture. And they actually called us the first horizontal because they were like, you guys are actually all of the other beats. Um, I mean, that's the biggest challenge, honestly, is most of the Politico reporters cover maybe four or five committees. I counted once, I cover 17 committees. So just like keeping track of, you know, hearings that are scheduled, and that's just the federal government. Like, then we also cover all the states that have legalized it. There's just so much to keep track of on this beat because it's still so spread out. It's not like, like there's no Department of Cannabis federally. Split. Thankfully, some of the states have done that, so it makes it a little, e a little easier. Like when California went from three to one department, we were like, thank God. Um, just, but like, it's just hard to, there's just so much to grab onto. It's, it's the blessing and the curse of yeah. covering cannabis, because that's 100% also what makes it fun. But yeah. sometimes it's just like, oh, stop. <laughs> it's the same for me, right? Like, you know, a lot of people email me saying like, have you seen the latest in Kansas? And I'm like, Dude, not really, right? Like I'm in Argentina, I'm looking at the entire world, all the states, all of what's going on in Canada while keeping track of the business side and the finance side of it. I have no idea what just happened in Kansas. I'm really sorry, you know, but there's no way I can do like a good story about this. You know, like here's all the process to getting pardoned. Like here are the 15 steps. You should do a story on this. And I'm like, yes, I should. I know I should. I know I'd love to, but there's no way I can do it right. You know, someone else can do it, right? Not me, probably. And it's challenging, sometimes very motivate, like very motivating and motivational and sometimes quite frustrating, right? When you find a story that you know is awesome, but you're not completely well-equipped to tell it the right way. I think, I think a good example of, you know, the, the uh, diffuse nature of the beat would be, you know, my week last week, I was or two weeks ago, you know, I was covering the jazz pharmaceuticals GW bill or deal, excuse me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, one, one hour I'm looking at, at jazz pharmaceuticals pipeline of neuroscience drugs, which is something I have very little expertise in, right. <laughs> I'm figuring out how GWs, you know, epilepsy drugs fit into this equation. Like why are they paying $7.2 billion for, for a cannabinoid company? Um, and then the next day I'm covering, you know, why the cannabis bill in New Jersey is stalled. So I'm figuring out all these sort of like ins and outs of New Jersey state politics. It couldn't be more different than neuroscience drugs, but it's all cannabis. And so it keeps it uh, very fresh and interesting from day to day, but it is also, it's hard to, to kind of keep your head wrapped around every single thing that you should be paying attention to and that you should be covering. Um, you know, luckily enough, uh, hopefully, you know, our stories can go a little deeper and we don't have to hit every single piece of news because that would be, uh, you know, not humanly possible right now, but, uh, you know, we, we can always uh, strive for that. So Wait, what, what was the conclusion for the GW Jazz Pharma acquisition? 
how did it fit in? They, yeah, it's a good question. You should, you should read, uh, you should read Jeremy Burke. He's a good, good reporter. No, I'm, <laughs> I heard I'm kidding. Did a good job on that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, they, 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 uh, Javier and I are like, please tell us. They're, they're, this is, this is my amateurish perspective, right? I'm not, I'm not a pharmaceutical reporter, but they are developing a, a pipeline of neuroscience drugs and epilepsy fits right into the sort of drug category they're trying to dominate. Um, Jazz as well is developing or trying to get an MS drug approved by the FDA that contains both THC and CBD. And wow. so I think jazz is a huge opportunity there. And MS is obviously, you know, I'm, I'm going to butcher the science, but it does have, you know, effects on your brain and, and, and you know, GW is pretty confident that, that they're going to get their drug approved in the next two to three years. So and this is so um, exciting that we haven't, that they're, they haven't even scratched the surface of all the use cases for all the cannabinoids, like what research. Totally. It's going to be such an exciting time. It really is. Yeah. And, and, you know, you guys are talking about, you know, there's so many, you know, streams of coverage and cannabis coverage has significantly picked up over the past year, obviously due to the industry's essential status during COVID and last year's election. So from your perspective, how has this reporting impacted mainstream perception of the industry? And also like what conversations are your newsrooms having about what cannabis coverage should look like in the next year or so as all these things have unfolded over the past year? Want to start, Javier? No, please. <laughs> Let someone else hear. All right, Jeremy, I'm, I'm just I like going to go <laughs> last time. I'm just going to go left, right, center. There you go. Jeremy, you want to start? Yeah, let me, I, need, I need to think for a second. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, it's hard. It's, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll caveat my answer with this. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to predict what I will be covering in 2022 because I barely know what I'll be covering on March 1st and on February 17th right now. Um, you know, that being said, I am very much looking forward to covering a little bit more policy, not to, not to sort of dive in onto Natalie's turf, but covering more policy and how it affects. I see on, that, uh, that stink guy, uh, Natalie. No, no, no. I, I, I should say, <laughs> covering, covering more policy and how it affects the companies that I cover. I think there's a lot of interesting things going on with lobbying. I think that the companies that I cover um, have to deal with rapidly changing policy, unlike in any other industry, uh, you know, to my knowledge. Um, they have to figure out how to capitalize on different trends. They kind of have to read the political tea leaves in ways that I think a lot of other companies don't. So I think that's sort of an interesting, uh, you know, story theme that I'd love to cover. And I'd love to kind of understand, like, how are they reading these tea leaves? Like, who are, the, who are these companies um, is talking to the people in D.C. or the people within state capitals to figure out, you know, why they should be doing X, Y and Z or why they should be spending money on A, B, and C. Um, so I think that's one area. Um, I will turn it over to my colleagues after that. <laughs> I mean, I do think in a way, my flip side of that same exact coin is, you know, the these companies are maturing and they actually have power a, a bit comparatively. Like they're not big pharma. They're not American Airlines in terms of like DC lobby yet, but they do have power. And this is an issue that is like, DC's issue this year, thanks to Chuck Schumer. And so for me, it's like, how is the fact that all of these businesses have grown so much and they have all of their own interests impacting policy? I mean, that's what I'm gonna be focused on for the next two years as like Schumer tries to legalize cannabis federally. Um, but I mean, it's uh, we're getting to the point, I mean, I would like to have another co-reporter because we've got 15 states now. You know, we're just like, there's there's so much going on and we are might have, 20 by the end of 2021, you know, easily, honestly, um, the way New Mexico and Virginia and New York are going right now. So I think, you know, I don't know that there's going to be a substantial, like we are going to rethink our reporting game. Like we're still going to be covering politics, but I think the scope is getting bigger. Um, I mean, like it's hard because there's so many little nitty gritty things that we have to report since we do a daily newsletter but there's also so many bigger pictures now that there's a lot of states and they're in different parts of the country and how like draw my favorite stories are like drawing lines between different states and what's going on in different states like I'm sitting in Washington state right now and they're looking at uh, legalizing home grow when they legalize cannabis as one, as one of the two first states to do this eight years ago nine years ago um, 2012, they did not allow home grow. And so it's an issue that Washington state is like, we should do this. It's not a big deal anymore. But 
New York and New Jersey are thinking about not allowing home grow in their legalization bills as they're like just stepping into adult use. And so as a politics reporter, I'm going, what is this, what is the through line here? Like, what are, is there a similarity in the reasons why Washington state is saying, let's do it now. And New Jersey, New York are saying, maybe we shouldn't, you know, are there anything you can connect? And I think as the industry expands and as more states get into this, there's more through lines that can be drawn between different states and also through like what's happening federally. I mean, the federal government wouldn't get so nuanced as to tell people if they could grow cannabis or not, they would leave that up to states as a policy discussion. But, you know, what, what, how do those decisions that are made at the states then affect the federal government? I, it's me really interesting to see how that plays out in New York and New Jersey, you know, the home grow. I, I'm really following that as well. Not that I have a plans at home, but, <laughs> but I am just sort of curious to see like, you know, where they're going to land with that because, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise around that. So I, I'd be curious to see, you know, where they land. And I guess we'll hear, I think we're yeah. going to get the regs in a, a, for New York April 1. So it, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, so we'll see where they land on that. Yeah. I'm really curious to, to know why Washington t state often does not succumb to many of the corporate pressures that other states, you know, are victim to, or at least, you know, allow, right, when dictating policy, right? Um, because from my perspective, at least, not allowing for home growing has more to do with industry uh, and monetary interest and financial interest than it would and I would think like, what do you say? I don't know. Like I see now. I mean, the, ori like, the like, original like, reasons for not allowing it was not about industry. It was like a boon to law enforcement and a boon to people who were nervous. Cause you have to remember that Washington state was one of was Washington and Colorado legalized the same day. So that was yeah. like a big trial. Like, are they gonna, you know, are the fed is the federal government gonna roll in on day one and shut everybody down? And so they were very that was just one of Washington state's things that they did to be like conservative in their legalization move. It wasn't so much like a, let's make sure that these industries can survive. And industries in the state have taken either a sort of like a middle line, like we're not getting involved, you do what you want to do, or they're supportive of it. Cause there is, I mean, there's a very, they kind of look at it with like the craft beer versus home grow, homebrew beer perspective, mm -hmm. which is also very strong in Washington state with like home brewing beer usually makes people also want to go to breweries because they just get into beer. And then they're like, I want to make my own, but also I'm going to go to all these breweries and try stuff out. And it makes them like a connoisseur. And so a lot of the smaller manufacturers are like, it's fine if people grow at home because that'll get them into it. And that'll make them more interested in like what I'm doing with my little craft cannabis. Like they'll learn more. I, so, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it, it's just like one of those things where they just didn't really get around to changing a rule that they that they passed nine years ago. And now they're kind of like, should we do that? Should we not do that? <laughs> um, I think the reasons in New York and New Jersey though are much more about the industry because the industry has grown so much since 2012 that now those interests are very seeped into mm -hmm. the passage of bills. In 2012, the industry was not really the forefront pusher. It was more of a, a criminal justice perspective thing. And now the industry is pushing just yeah. as hard as advocates. So it's kind of turned the homegrown conversation on its yeah. head. Yeah. But the way it was legalized was still very American, right? Like here's my perspective from yeah. Argentina, right? We recently passed regulations for, for medical cannabis. And the initial, you know, rules revolved around home growing and community growing, which is essentially a caregiver model. And the rest will be figured out in coming months, right? But the priority was placed on patients and, and, and fast, easy access versus creating an industry, which is something that even, you know, in the earlier models, I didn't quite completely see in the States, even in Colorado, right? Where, where there was this whole caregiver model. It was still very, you know, capitalistically <laughs> thought out and oriented, right? Uh, so it's it's hard for me to envision reasons to oppose home growing if it's not just you know beyond uh, the the financial reasons, right? The rest is, is you know kind of not based in great arguments, right? Like people don't know how to grow, and maybe it's you know dangerous if they grow at home. It's, is it though? <laughs> how dangerous is is it to? You're grow also your 
You're right. also making judgments on political rationale from nine years ago with the knowledge of now. And, yeah. you know, I talked to a, uh, a pollster who's worked a lot on this um, right before the November election. And she said that nothing has changed more quickly um, in like the perspective of American voters aside from gay marriage um, in America huh. in like decades. And, and this isn't just a, a can you or can't you, this is like an entire economy um, that people are just suddenly now like, this is fine. Like we should all buy weed now. Right. Um, and so that's like, there's a lot more regulations that go into legalizing marijuana than go into like, can you marry someone or can you not marry someone, right? And so it's just like, states and lawmakers are just rushing to keep up with that switch. And I think that when we try to judge states and lawmakers, even on what they did two years ago with like the, the either the knowledge base, like the scientific knowledge base or the political perception or the political capital that an issue has now, even two years ago, it's like dog years, cannabis years are dog years. Like two years ago, it was totally different. Nine years ago, like, I, I, I can't understate how, like, seriously worried they were that the DOJ was going to roll in and shut them down, which now to us yeah. just seems silly because the DOJ never did that. But right. a very different perspective. And then. even two years ago, I don't think we would have seen, like, this five-state sweep that we saw, you know, in, in last year's election. And Natalie, you brought up a really good point that part of is some of these conversations early on, you know, we're surrounding, you know, you know social justice, right, or, um, you know, some of the criminalization. And, you know, many industry leaders this year, which has been great, have highlighted the importance of increasing, you know, representation in the industry. So, you know, I want to, you know, move on to this sort of point. What role can the media play in amplifying underrepresented voices? And do you think there are any stories that are being overlooked by as more outlets cover the legalization movement sweeping the nation? I'd love to talk a little about, about the coverage of the underrepresentation in the industry and how you guys are looking at it. Yeah, I think, I think you know, from, from our perspective, I mean, the way, the way that we like to think about that question is who, who our sources are. Um, you know, we, we try and make an effort to, to put different, you know, minority sources or women in our stories. There's a lot of uh, white men who, who invest in the industry and who, who run these companies. And we try and look for different perspectives there. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, I'm a reporter. I can't make a value judgment on what is right or wrong, but I can do, you know, I, I can play a big role in amplifying different voices and amplifying different perspectives. Um, we often find ourselves you know, caught in the middle between, you know, speaking with activists on the ground, as well as the CEOs of, you know, multi-billion dollar companies who often will, will say the same things publicly, but have very, very different perspectives when you sort of query mm -hmm. that. So it, it, it's, our, it's our role to kind of show that there is discussion there and that there is an argument there and to figure out who we are amplifying. But in terms of taking a, a stand and saying the industry should do this or that, um, you know, I, I don't, personally an insider doesn't believe that that's our role to take. I mean, we have to cover mm -hmm. what happens, what's going to come next and what did happen. Um, but, you know, it, it's not our job to say that, um, you know, cannabis legalization should be to repair the, you know, the harms of the war on drugs or cannabis legalization should be to, um, you know, fill state budget deficits or any of these other arguments for cannabis legalization or even, you know, the classic states rights libertarian argument, you know, we, we, we're sort of agnostic to that, but we want to make sure that we include those perspectives when we report on those stories. Yeah. And I like, I like yeah. that idea of like, you know, finding sources, right? Like you have a lot of sources at your disposal and, and there are some ways to amplify voices just by gaining different perspectives. And I think that's like a fair and balanced way to probably do it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes it, it takes a real conscious effort and decision, right? As Jeremy says, we are not to say or you know what is right for the industry and or what is right for the rest of the people but i know what is right for me and what is right for the company i work for and the company i run right and and that is having equal representation right a few months ago um a lady from brazil brought to my attention that that the, the, there's this concept of manos which is panels made out entirely of males or <laughs> Uh, all males and just a female moderator, just to fill that spot. Like, okay, here, here you go. Like, this is our quota. And, and you know, after that conversation, I took over the, the production and programming of the Benzinga Cannabis Hour. It's an hourly, you know, like weekly show that runs every Thursday. And, and my first decision was, we'll have a woman on every show. Like, no matter what, 
we'll have a woman in every show. And I had to deschedule three months that we had, you know, planned ahead, just like cancel every show and redo them. Uh, and it's been hard. I mean, it was hard at first. Now, it, I'm, I've, you know, I've gotten the hang of it. But at first, it was really hard, you know, and and a part of, you know, a role of media is exposing some of these issues, right? And it first talked about female executives in the industry being 24, 26%, like five years ago. And it was like, this is good, but we should do better. And then, you know, like three years ago, it was down to like 20%. And I was like talking about it. But, you know, what was I doing beyond talking about it? And, and you know, in, in this exercise, what I found is, is actually what I've been reporting was even uh, more like it was still inaccurate because it wasn't really like 20%, right? Uh, and so circling back, sorry, you know, it takes a conscious effort and sometimes it's hard. I go through the C-suite of many large cannabis companies and can't find a woman, like really cannot find one woman, right? And, and it takes extra work, but you know, it's something I feel we need to do. Uh, and even if it's sometimes it feels forced at first, right? Like, you know, why am I making this conscious effort? Isn't this condescending? Well, guess what? You know, perceptions are shaped that way, right? If you get used to not seeing women on a million panels, you go like, okay, I guess this is about right, right? This is how the industry looks like. It's fair. It represents the industry. Well, maybe sometimes we, we, we should show also what we want it to be. And again, not like... It's not like we have the right or position to say this should be, but I definitely have a spot to say this is what I would like it to be, right? So I, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of yeah, lost the train. I love that. No, there are I don't know where we're going, but I do. I'm oh, sorry. I, I was sorry. saying, you know, it, they get to your point, like there are ways, there are things that we can control, right? Like we, we can't make yeah. the choice of who they're hiring, right? We can't make the choice of what stories are breaking, right? But if there are ways to, as you guys have been saying, amplify that are, you know, non-judgment based, I mean, those seem like great fixes and a great way to, mm -hmm. to move forward. Yeah, even with sponsors, it's like, you know, people sponsor our events. And my first question is, do you have a woman you can send over? Like, do you have a minority representative? Or do you also want to send your white male CEO? Like, you know, it's your choice. At the end of the day, you know, this is your decision. But I will make the conscious effort and the explicit, you know, effort to get representation everywhere, right? And then, you know, it's, it's up to you as a company, as a policymaker, as an activist to, you know, go for diversity or not. Yeah, I definitely think that there's, I think everyone assumes we can control a whole lot more in cannabis than we can control. Um, I mean, I have been yelled at so many times because people didn't like what I printed a lawmaker said. And I was like, talk to the lawmaker. Don't talk to me. Like, don't yell at me about this. Like, don't shoot the messenger. But one thing we can control is who we talk to and who we interview. And, you know, if we're doing, I mean, I know that my team will have conversations where we're, if we're doing a story where we're talking to CEOs, we're like, have we just talked to white dudes? Like, let's take another day and let's make sure that we're talking to women and we're talking, trying to find the, you know, that that uh, CEO who's a person of color also, which I mean, as we all know from covering this industry is a very rare thing. And mm -hmm. recognizing that elevating someone's voice also elevates the people see that. Like, it's not like when we, what we do exists in a vacuum. We can't control what they say. We can't control what the industry is doing, but we can control partially. And it's like, it's kind of a, a, a line you have to play because you don't want to take someone who literally doesn't know anything and then put them over mm -hmm. people who do know things. Um, but when you have the opportunity, when someone very much fits a situation, saying, if I only interview white dudes, all other white dudes are just going to see the other white dudes, and they're yeah. just going to keep talking to the other white dudes. And if I interview a lobbyist who's a woman or a lobbyist who's a person of color in a situation where I can interview any lobbyist, like that is also elevating them within their field. And if I interview a CEO, and I just need a CEO, you know, I don't need to talk to this specific company that knows about this mm -hmm. specific deal. I just need a CEO. If I in am more intentional about who I go and find, yeah. That also, it's like what we're doing is also elevating people within their sphere. You know, it, it's like, obviously it's a hard line to walk because as journalists, you want to be covering things. You don't want to be, um, you don't want to be 
personally like affecting the news. You're, you're covering the news. You're not creating mm -hmm. the news. But the thing you can choose is if you're like, there's 20 people I can interview for this story. Let me try to make sure that it's not all just white dudes. Yeah. Or the four that we quote are not all just white dudes. And sometimes we'll be really, really intentional about being like, let's go back through, you know, ah, oh, man, perfect quote, but it's our fourth white dude for the story. Well, let's go see if we can find like, let's not just fall into this like easy world where we're like, but it's the best quote. Like that's a cop out. Like, yeah. let's go try to find maybe like a similar quote from one of the women that we spoke to um, and like put that in the story, even if it's not like the slam dunk, like the point is not, cause sometimes it just different stories, different people come up with that great quote in that moment, right? And you can't necessarily control which person is gonna have the slam dunk quote on which story. Sometimes all the women have the slam dunk quote. Sometimes it's just a bunch of the dudes, you know? But it's like actually being very intentional about picking how many people you're talking to in a story and like who you put in. And I know we, sh we fall short. Sometimes we're just in such a hurry and we're like, I mean, it's a joke on our team that like we just quote all the Oregon senators because so often I will send out emails to 10 Senate offices and only Wyden and Merkley will get back to me. And I'm like, well, we're just gonna <laughs> quote the two Oregon senators again. You know what I mean? But it's, so sometimes yeah. there's situations like that you but can't it, control, yeah. but when you can control it, sorry, I know I'm talking a ton, but like when you no, can no, control it is I'm my point. It's like important as a reporter to control and, that. And, and to your point, yeah. it is, and I realize we're on the other side because we're pitching you things. Sometimes it's like, you guys don't have that many options. Like we know we look even across our client base and we're trying to be more intentional about who we're bringing as clients because when, you know, Javier will reach out, like what woman do you guys have for a panel or South by Southwest says, you know, we want to make sure we have a diverse panel and we look at our client list. We're like, I have nobody put forward. I have no, you know, you know, you know, black CEOs. Like, how is that even possible if we have 40 clients, right? So sure. even though something that we're trying to do, we need to make sure that what we're offering, if we're offering you the same, you know, people over and over again, that's, it makes your job a lot harder, right? So I think even yeah. on the other side, people who are pitching clients, we need to make sure that we've got a diverse, you know, you know, set of clients as well. So it's definitely, mm -hmm. you know, challenging the industry and also points to just what a problem it is. If, if I have 50 clients and nobody to give to you, that's just a systematic yeah. problem, right? Yeah. Um, so of you guys course. are dealing with, you're dealing with a lot. It's not only on you, it's that you don't have that many sources. Mm -hmm. So I, I got, I got excited, you know, with, with what Natalie was saying, by the way, because right before this call, I was having, you know, a conversation like off the record with this uh, guy who manages a, a diversity fund, right. That recently launched. And, and we were discussing this fallacy that, you know, kind of exists in the business world where it's like minority talent or black talent is hard to find. It's like, well, yeah, it's hard to find that. That is no excuse not to go look for it. Right. And not to find it. Right. And, and it's there's an easy way out. Sometimes you need an easy way out for a source. It's like I need a source now. But sometimes, you know, the extra mile is required and warranted. Right. It's 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 not an excuse. It's hard to find. Like, it's our job to find stuff. Right. Like literal definition of our job is like find out about stuff that people don't know about and tell them. Right. Yeah. So if our excuse, you know, ends up being like, oh, there are very few black CEOs. It's like, well. You know, find them, quote them. You know, Absolutely, take we all have a lot. We all have a lot of work to do, and, and I, I love the commitment of of this whole entire group. You know, to try to do that. You know, and in terms of you know telling the stories, um, you know, to consumers and, and your readers, I, I'd love to like sort of shift a, 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 again from your perspective. You know, what are some of the common misconceptions that readers still have about cannabis, and what is it like the fundamental factor idea you think the average mainstream reader should know about the industry? A lot of people are just starting to learn about the industry over the past year or two. What do they need to know, you know, when they're like dissecting one of your stories uh, about the industry? Any of you can jump in there. I mean, just the, the first the first thought that occurs to me is that, you know, th this industry employs over uh, 300,000 people right now. Um, it's one of the fastest growing industries in, in the U.S., uh, just speaking U.S. specific. Um, there are more people employed in the cannabis industry than there are dental hygienists or, or things that you interact with very commonly in everyday life. So I think just how big it is and how economically powerful it will become, I think that is something that we really want to communicate to readers, you know, for better or worse, right? I'm not, again, you know, <laughs> to, to my earlier point, I don't want to make a value judgment on cannabis legalization. There are a lot of positives to it, but these are also companies that are going to make money on something that affects your brain chemistry, right? It's like, how are they being responsible in bringing these products to market? 
Um, as mm -hmm. soon as they get bigger and more powerful, they're going to want to obviously expand their consumer base. Uh, more people are going to work for these companies. How are these companies treating their employees? So I just think that the size of the industry just demands a full-time attention and all the effects downstream that has on, on healthcare, employment, economy, um, even policy. I think that's a, that's a really mm -hmm. crucial fact that we you know, are, are hopefully getting across in our reporting. Mm -hmm. Another big mis misconception I see like from the investment side is, is like the still, the, you know, there's still this novelty investor, right? And, and they go like, how do I make money with cannabis? Like, what's the best company, right? And, and, and they expect a recommendation as if we were talking about cryptocurrencies or the next hype. And as Jeremy is saying, there's a lot more to it, right? There's, there's impact on people's lives and healthcare, right? So it's not it just an, an, you know, like, how do I make money kind of story, or, or approach. And I do see a lot of that, just people not fully understanding the many aspects of life and society and the economy that, that the industry touches on. They just see it as a novelty play that you know, may or may not survive in the future. It's like, okay, I need to have some Bitcoin. So why not Sundial? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I, I say this with, um, I don't know, some humility because it's the same misconception that I had before I was assigned to this. So I don't want to say that like these people that think this are stupid, but just like, oh, no. <laughs> how, how, I just mean like, it's a misconception, but it's the one that I had walking into this is that it's just totally not understanding how the depth of how much cannabis policy impacts so many aspects of life, especially for minorities and people of color and people who are low income. And I mean, I'm just now delving into, you know, housing, employment, child services. Like um, we've obviously talked a lot about the six, over 600,000 people that are still arrested every year in the United States for cannabis possession or cannabis use. And it's just, it's, you know, I, I didn't realize how, it seems kind of funny or silly, right? From the outside, you think of like a pothead kid in his basement with his tie dye, um, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy in college. You think of Jeremy in college, um, <laughs> but it's. <laughs> but there are people serving sixty-year sentences for cannabis. There are there are ten-year-olds that are alive because of cannabis. There are. Uh, you know, big businesses that want to make a ton of money off cannabis. And there's small businesses that are struggling to keep afloat on business. There are small farmers who are generation, multi-generational farmers who learned how to farm a product from their parents and from their grandparents. And the product just happens to be cannabis. It's like, it's an incredibly broad thing. And there's a ton of people in this from very different walks of life. And you can feel for all of them or you can get angry at all of them. And it's just, it's such a deeper issue than I think, I think people still, and a lot of other media outlets still treat it as this kind of like funny, silly thing. Like everyone publishes the like, another state legalized weed. But it's like, do you understand just the vast impact that that has? And I think people don't. Um, I think that what happened this past summer or last summer with, you know, just kind of, the even greater national attention on the Black Lives Matter movement has brought it a little bit more to the forefront. It's definitely made it more a part of federal policy. Um, but I think even like for me reading books like The New Jim Crow last summer and just seeing cannabis everywhere in that book made me really realize even more how big of a deal this is. And I wish I could just shake everyone and tell them like, it's not a silly thing. It's just not. It's people in prison, it's kids with seizures, it's small business owners, it's small farmers, it's giant business owners, it's, you know, it's big pharma, it's all of these things and none of them are silly. Yeah. I love that. I have another question, but I wouldn't even wrap with that. No, but that, 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 no, <laughs> no, 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 you make a good point. And also, you know, you're talking about, and, and I'll bring us our final questions, you are, um, you know, running out of time and considering everything we've discussed and, you know, to your point about how people are covering it. And I know it's maybe a little biased to ask this group, but let's circle back to the question that brought us here in the first place. Is cannabis media coverage fair or biased, you know, across the board? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 you know, double down on that and, and talk about fair bias, right? 
there's no fair and there's no biased, but there may, may be a fair bias in my opinion, right? We're all biased. We're all pro-cannabis and, and we want to paint it. Well, maybe. <laughs> now you can go. No, uh, I, you finish. <laughs> no, no, I want to hear now. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm not. I'm not pro or anti cannabis. That Politico doesn't take a stance on it, and none of us do. And I think, but that's it's like not a commentary on anybody else. And there's definitely a lot of other news outlets that are very pro cannabis. And I don't say that they shouldn't be, but oh, I no, think no. that like for Politico's purposes, we want to be a voice that is not. You know, obviously, like we all have our own experiences with cannabis, positively or negatively. Everyone's bringing all of their own stuff to the table um but you know we're, we're trying to at least be like the uh, you know a central voice that mm -hmm. politicians can look to for like just the facts when they're trying to make their okay, uh, let, let me decision. let me rephrase that we are not anti-cannabis right at the very least right we're reporting on it from if you will a semi-progressive perspective as opposed to the one you know that previously dominated the media that was informed by by a lack of knowledge and prejudice right so whatever whatever your bias is there is some kind of bias and that was what we were talking about you know the last time we spoke about this and it's you know is there a fair bias and i believe there is right and and because every media outlet has some kind of bias right whether we like to acknowledge it or not or what how no matter how much we try to be as central and as you know centric and as centered as possible you know there's always a bias that informs what we consume what kind of media we get our information from what kind of publications like scientific studies or scholarly you know uh papers we take our information from who we believe right who whose word we take more seriously right even if we don't want to so that is kind of my what I what I propose is like maybe not fair or biased, but you know the 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 range that comprises a fair bias. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's. I, I mean, I, I guess I, I can only speak to myself. Um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the others in, in this on this topic, but I think that you know, again, again, to the earlier point that we discussed, I think we are pretty agnostic to how this whole thing shapes out. I have my personal belief that, you know, the facts on the ground do bear out that, you know, legalization generally has a lot of positives, though, though there are negatives to it. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in terms of the bias that I take, obviously, you know, I, I carry that with me in my reporting, but we, we do want to make sure that we are very carefully reporting the facts and not amplifying one side over the other, because there are mm -hmm. very credible arguments against cannabis legalization. There are very credible arguments to make this, you know, I don't know, like, like Canadian healthcare, like if, if no company wins in the end, you know, personally speaking, I don't really care. It, it's just, it, this is how the policy is going to shake out. This is how it's going to happen. And so, you know, I hope that we are bringing that across in our reporting. I mean, at least, you know, in my perspective, I don't really consider myself a part of the cannabis movement. I don't consider myself a part of the industry. I report on the industry and I report on the movement um, with all the positives and negatives that entails. And I, I, I do like to kind of communicate that with sources because when you cover sort of emerging sectors like this, whether it's cryptocurrency or cannabis, um, mm -hmm. you end up being put in the position as a cheerleader. Um, and I would, I would be yeah. very vociferous in saying that I am not a cheerleader. I, I want to report on the facts. Obviously, as Javier's point mentions, I, it, it is impossible to remove your bias. You have subconscious biases in everything you do and everyone you talk to. Um, but we, we try and keep it, um, uh, we try and keep the argument very centered and keep both arguments in mind as we report on this. Super true. I'm going to take that one, you know, about the cheerleading, <laughs> you know, as yeah. a warning to others. <laughs> like, yeah, I would definitely say that there, uh, I mean, I think all pro cannabis advocates think that we're like on their side as Politico yeah. and that all the anti cannabis advocates think that we're like all out to get them all of the time. And I would say that we like piss both sides off in equal measure. Like, mm -hmm. And I've actually like told one of them once when like, I won't say which side it was, but like I'd literally <laughs> just been screamed at for the other side. And I was like, well, you should go grab a drink with. And I listed like their opposite advocate. And they were like, what? And I was like, cause you're both angry at me. And they're like, uh. and I was like, 
this, this misinformation. <laughs> and I think it was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like their first moment where they realized that like, no, we're not on the other person's side um, and we're not on their side either. And I think that's like something that I'm just like, whether or not, like I definitely, I, every reporter has that moment where they find out a fact that doesn't personally jive with what they personally want to be true and being a yeah. journalist is not to be a blank page that has no opinions because you're going to create a lot of opinions when you focus on something the part of being a journalist is learning how to overcome that thing in the pit of your stomach that turns when you realize that you were wrong <sighs> in your yeah. opinion and then being like cool well facts say different i report facts and like reporting what it says like that's what being a journalist is and i, I wish more people understood that Reporting against that. your own biases, I think, is, is really important, too. Um, yeah. If you have a thesis for a story or, or, sorry, a hypothesis for a story, you should query sources that might think otherwise. Uh, I yeah. think that's really Try to prove it. The, the best way to, to fully prove your hypothesis is try to prove it really hard and fail at it. <laughs> well, guys, I, I wish we had more time. You know, maybe we'll, we'll go a little over, you know, another time. But we do have to wrap for today. Thank you, Natalie, Javier, and Jeremy for joining us today. Um, it was great to chat with you. Um, thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> All right. We're good. Thanks, guys. We only went over by a couple seconds. So I think we're right. That was good. That was actually better than the last time. So it was, I, thought it was, I thought it went well. Thanks, everyone. We definitely yeah. like got deep in some like...